So we get uh, a few more slots available on the board. I decided to break the rule and actually go for my second session of the day. I haven't stopped anybody at any chance of presenting. If you guys have presented, well done. If you haven't, why, why have you let me post a second session? God. Right. So uh, this one is actually a session I have presented last year at Metrocam San Francisco. So the video. So that's actually. Uh, I had two versions of other ones. The gym stuff or digital links association said, on oh, your slides I got too much text, people actually read it and don't send you what you say. But I forgot what my deck was about and those guys at the back actually chose the session for you, so I have chosen the verbal version and have a text. So because it reminds me as well what I'm supposed to say. So there you go, let's start. So imagine this is a company that's never had a web of text before. So that guy there with the grey hair, the glasses and beard. Is the boss of the company of the department. He goes like, I've got this great idea, we're going to be a data-driven organization, we're going to have this analytic solution. Okay, have a look, this is how it looks like, these are reports. So you've got those people who are like, oh, that's interesting, what's that? And, right. So they need to become data-driven organization, and they have all the software, and, um, but what they decide is that everybody is going to have access to it. Okay, what one can go with that? Okay. So imagine that's, uh, I don't know, let's call her Kate. Okay, uh, and that's a manager, and the manager goes like, okay, uh, this is his new analytics tool, and this is what you need to do. And she goes in like, what the hell, <laughs> what's this thing? <laughs> all right, okay, this is what you need to do. Okay, you just open all those reports, and then all the insights which you stick out. And so you just look for insights, and then, uh, make recommendations and then we send out a C suite and they're going to be very happy and it's because um, every morning at the clock they'll have those reports and they'll know what to do. Right. So it's pretty easy. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure. You don't do the reporting, right? Okay, it's easy for you to say that, right? So one day they have a, a meeting. So two guys, two different managers have uh, those reports that uh, Katie has produced and uh, um, they look at the reports and wow, it doesn't match, that's uh, different graphs, completely different figures. And both of them are sure they're right, they've done the right analysis, or they trust the guys who produce reports, the analysis for them, but they have conflicting figures on stuff that's supposed to be exactly the same. So also I'm like, who's right, who's wrong? Right, but I'm sure I did it right. You're wrong, I'm right. No, no, I'm right, you're wrong. Right, that kind of story. So those guys are thrown a deep end, they don't even know how to use a tool, and there's no documentation about how the report, uh, the raw data was processed, it was filtered, etc. So chances are they're both right, but they don't know how data was processed. It's not documented, maybe, so they don't realize they're comparing apples with oranges, really. The raw data might be the same, but actually the way it was processed is different. So that gives them a pretty different uh, set of figures. Uh, but with all the actually matching, due to lack of training and lack of data literacy, you have a kind of problem. So, yeah, exactly. So uh, people think that uh, they were extracting the right data, which is probably correct, but it was not documented. And then what happens is the C suite decides, okay, this is crazy, we spend so much money on that on the license for that product, and uh, this is not getting a return that we're we expecting. The different managers have different uh, sets of data, they don't know which one is correct, so they start uh, mistrusting the tool. So what we decide, what C3 decides, is to create um, a single analytics hub, center of excellence kind of stuff, to impose a single version of the truth. You guys probably have heard of a concept, a single version of the truth. So you have one team that just crunches the data, they expert in the tool, and only one person does that processing so that everybody gets exactly the same figures of organization, right? That's one way of addressing the issue. I worked for a company that had exactly that problem. When I joined, the uh, c suite decided to create an IT team and I was recruited in that team. So imagine that Robert and he's been in that field for 30 years at least. And this is Jess and She's new in the organization. So, what do we do? Ah, you are head of analytics. Actually, she's the head of analytics. Right? She's been, uh, she has a master's or even a PhD in econometrics and stats. She's a math maker, basically. So, 
actually three global figures, 13 hands. His experience is based on decades of working in that field. So he has a lot of domain knowledge, but she doesn't. Right, and so he, so Robert has heard that, uh, oh, the Jess has been appointed as the head antics. Ah, oh, you head antics, okay, cool. So, Robert, oh, okay, uh, remember the name's right, okay. So what did they do? Actually, Dr. Robert H. <laughs> you know, he, he finds his stuff is important, right? So what did he do? So he had experience, uh, he has experience in his field. And uh, he was told by the C-suite, okay, well, now you can't make decisions based on experience anymore. Okay, uh, that works good until now, but now we need to be a data-driven organization. We don't care about your 30 years of experience. So obviously he's not too happy about that. Right. And basically, yeah, he sees the NTC team, and the NTC team has a bit of a gadget, which is going to be supporting him. They're never going to, it's not going to let that NTC team dictate what he's supposed to do. He has his set way of doing things, and he finds actually the NTC team will support him rather than actually dictate whatever he has to do. And just, damn it, remote is so crazy. Actually, Jessica. She, well, she's probably a doctor as well, but actually she doesn't care about the title so much. So yeah, well, actually she was a business analyst working in big four consultancy, and uh, she's been hired away from that consultancy to be leading a small team, and uh, yeah, straight out of business school after three years, four years. And uh, yeah, so that's the person that this week has uh, hired to transform the organization. So, she wants to actually dictate a bit more uh, the way the company does things, and uh, she thinks that the organizations are like some old dinosaur that they must embrace the new way of doing things and become data driven, use uh, Python or whatever, and stuff like that. Data. Right. Six months later, what happens? Okay, let the battle for credit begin. Right. So both sides, both people, Rob and Jessica, they actually really want to take credit, right, for the work we do. So Robert has his way of doing things, he's used to having a certain share of credit, and he, is, he wants to hold on to that. That situation is not want to, to share that credit so much with anybody else. Especially somebody who's brand new in the organization that's only been working for about three, four years. And you're like, you're a spring chicken to me, okay, I've been working here for 30 years, okay, who are you? Right. I, I totally understand that. Okay. But Jessica, she has her own ideas on how the business is going to be uh, data driven and she wants to do things a bit differently, which is quite understandable. So Dr. Robert H. and now Mr. L. basically is all the colleagues. So the way they're going to handle institutions by doing this, they're going to bombard Jessica and her team with requests for a lot of data. Right? And then they want to find themselves the actual insights. Right. They don't want to let Jessica's team find the actual insight and then tell them what they have to do. They want to keep that credit firm and that, that decision power, basically, for themselves. But one problem that brings is that actually they will start cherry-picking the data. So they have one idea of how things should be working. They look at all of the data, they're going to pick data that makes sense to them. And when it doesn't make sense to them, they're going to discard completely and they're going to go like, yeah, but data, I'm not sure that's correct. Maybe that's been implemented wrong. So it's hard to tell the difference for someone like Robert between data that's a product of a bad implementation from data that's correct, but that completely contradicts the beliefs. Right. So instead of just uh, questioning their own beliefs, they would just go like, yeah, I just got that later, maybe if I have time. But for now, just focus on your purely what confirms what I believe in. So that way they can play a game of superficial compliance with the C-suite and they can keep doing business as before and they just find data that confirms what they want. So they can sprinkle that data on top of that, those initiatives and then they can send that to C-suite as, hey, look, this is backed by analytics data, there you go. But the C-suite doesn't know any better. Exactly, so they just discard what doesn't match what we leave as just noise. Okay. And Jessica and her team, what do they do? 
So they, they actually managed to find some time to extract factual insight from the data, but nobody wants to listen to them. And the values of those reports, daily manually, uh, daily weekly, monthly manual reports. And that's pretty much all they do. And uh, monitoring all the data, because they're supposed to be the guardians of data quality. Mm -hmm. so many, uh, it's a really job to, uh, job to be monitoring the data, really, not just one team or one person. Um, the problem with uh, the monitoring, uh, basically they have to do this because IT teams do releases all the time on the website and then they don't care about analytics. And then also then as, a, as an analyst, when you do a report every other month, a month maybe, but I mean, to me, I just realized oh, we lost all the injuries tracking like three weeks ago. And I didn't know because I do my report only once a month. So then the rest of the management goes like, are you not supposed to be guarding your data quality and check your data every day? Uh, well, I'm too busy finding actual insights, or you don't have time to find data monitoring. Well, you should be doing that. So all of a sudden, that's people in Jessica's team has to do monitoring as well, to catch the errors, or the, uh, the carelessness, I should say, of the IT teams. And what she does you, they extract out the data, because Robert, his team, and these guys ask a lot of data. So that's what they do. So, yeah, the X story. I don't know if you know this one. Okay. So in the 50s in the US, there was this company called Betty Crocker. And they were selling or trying to sell at least cake mixes. So cake mixes, you got a small pocket of, of powder, and basically mix up with water, and put that in a tin and your oven, and then half an hour later, you got a cake. Right. So the feeling of the time was 50s after World War II, a lot of companies decided to make the lives of housewives a lot easier. So that's when uh, dishwashers appeared on the market and uh, washing machines and, and they decided, okay, well, what can we make to do to make lives easier for the housewives? Hey, let's make a cake mix. And they thought it was going to sell a lot, but actually it didn't sell at all, really. And why is that? So 52, exactly, yeah. So the Coco, they announced the first cake mix in cell, and they hired a, a bunch of uh, psychologists to uh, assemble um, a, a focus group, basically a consumer group. And basically they found an issue with the cake mix was the cake sticks to the tins, and it has a funny taste or texture. So these are telltale signs that actually that's kind of a fake cake, and Hans Weiss didn't like that very much. So, they analyzed it further, the, uh, the mix, what entered uh, the composition of the mix, and they found that those issues were caused by the powder decks. So they decided, well, what is the solution in this? You know what? Let's take the powder decks from the cake mix. And like, why have it? It's not going to produce a cake anymore. But just a little packaging, and just put out a fresh egg onto the mix, and there you go. And that's what the, exactly what they did, and it started selling a lot better. So go figure why that happened. Actually, there's a simple explanation why. So basically, what happened is the last wise felt like they were cheating like by using a cake mix, as opposed to baking a real cake. And the, uh, the fact that the cake was sticking to a tin said that I can show they were a sign that actually, like I was saying, they were fake cakes and not real cakes. And they were going get, to get out by their families, by their, their husbands, and all that, the kids, and be reproached. But actually they're not doing, spending the time to make a real cake and using shortcuts. So after removing the product, you could not tell the difference between the two types of cakes. And adding the one egg actually was basically giving the housewives enough emotional involvement in baking the cake. Actually, they don't feel like cheating anymore. Right. And they actually, the time they sailed, actually, they started using it to spend more time decorating the cakes as an attempt to claim credit. Because when you use a cake mix, basically, you feel like cheating, you, have, you can't claim any credit for it. But if you use, if you start having to add an egg to the cake mix, you have a bit more involvement in making the cake, and if you spend more time decorating it, well, you get even more credit. So people have a need to claim credit for whatever they do. And perhaps that's a problem we have in analytics, with the teams we try to influence. Maybe we give them a cake mix, and they actually don't have enough claim uh, for credit for what we give them because we give them turnkey solutions that are ready to use. But who's getting credit for that? Jessica's team, not Roberts. Alright. 
algorithms, okay, people don't trust them. <laughs> so it's a very similar story. So this guy, uh, Dr. Um, I think it's uh, Dietmar uh, Dietholst, uh, what's his name, yeah. Beverly J. Dietholst. He's a professor at the University of Chicago. And basically, he did a, a really strange experiment. Um, he divided people into groups and he told them, okay, uh, there's this algorithm that makes very, very good predictions for the stock market, for example, I'm not sure what it was exactly. And uh, would you use it? So those guys said, yeah, no problem. Um, he said, okay, that algorithm is very good, it beats humans. Okay, it's non biased, it's fast, etc. So people had no problem using it. And another group, he told them, um, that algorithm beats humans, but sometimes it makes atrocious, catastrophic mistakes in prediction. Still, overall, it has better performance than what you maybe would be doing. Would you be using that? And most people said no. Even though it had overall better performance. And the third group is told them, well, this algorithm makes catastrophic mistakes, but you have the opportunity to tweak your recommendations before you use them. Uh, would you use that? And they were prepared to use it again. Because they want to claim credit for the uh, recommendations. So they don't want to expose themselves into uh, catastrophic errors of judgment. But if they can actually tweak them, they, that restores the trust they have into uh, using that algorithm. And there's, there's a similar uh, example of this is uh, the Tesla cars. Okay, Tesla cars are have those atrocious problems, the car explodes and catch fire and stuff like that, but overall it's the safest car ever built. So what would you do? Would you buy a Tesla car if you had the money for it? Or would you not? Would you rather buy a car you drive yourself, which actually is less safe than a Tesla? It's very personal judgment. So yeah, that's just what I explained. Okay, so option two, people can make their own forecast. That's meant to uh, they actually uh, they have to accept the judgment, but actually make sure that mistakes and then option three, they can tweak it. So people didn't want to line processes in people. So maybe trust is just really an excuse, basically when people say, oh, I don't trust the data. No, what they really mean is actually, I can't claim enough credit for this to really implement your recommendation. So, we have a bit of music. I don't have any sound playing, but okay, let's go with that story. You guys know my way, okay? It's a famous song that's been covered many, many, many times. And probably the most famous version is Frank Sinatra's version. But actually, he did not write a song and actually didn't even invent a melody. Okay, fine, a lot of singers do that. They have songs written for them, and they just sing it, which is fine. So, Paul is actually the guy who adapted the lyrics for uh, Frank Sinatra. He's a singer himself, and he adapted the song, the original lyrics, into English for Frank Sinatra. He wanted to sing the song, and actually the song was a French song. Yeah, it's a French one. It's kind of a yeah. So the melody, actually, he, he didn't write the melody. I think he kind of co-wrote his two other guys. And he kind of gave direction about how he wanted the song to evolve, as it feels like, even more and more emotional as the song progresses. And Polanka thought, like, yeah, but it makes a lot of rubbish. I'm going to change them completely. I kind of keep the idea of that uh, middle aged man towards the end of his career, but that's a story of an older man in the original song that actually, the song that was from the world, the, well, he co wrote. So the original song is more like a story about a man in his 30s, mid 30s. And my way is more so even man in his 50s, if not even later. Right. So who can claim credit for my way? Um, I believe that all of them can claim credit for the song. So Claude Francois made the song a big success in France and French speaking countries, and probably here as well. Um, Paul Anka can claim credit for adapting the lyrics into English. And then, for instance, I can credit it for his own version of it. So actually, credit can be split in different levels, basically. So I feel that nobody can really claim, once a person can claim credit for being data-driven in organization, actually each team has a level at which they can claim credit. 
So for Chris French Partition, uh, lyrics and melody. Okay. And they all should get credit. Everybody has heard the song and even Sid Vicious. I don't know if you know the version of Sid Vicious. <laughs> it's pretty atrocious, <laughs> but it's quite funny at the same time. So uh, I like that version of the song as well. Right, so going back to uh, Dr. Robert and uh, Jessica. So actually, they could make a great team. Let's see how they should be working instead of the cuts. They make a different cut of uh, credits. Um, both sides can get a win win deal. Call me Robert. And basically, the experienced people in the organization should give a steer to the analytics team. Right? So instead of just letting the analysts lose your data, we should actually start with business question, right? Okay, can we improve at KPI, sales, can we reduce the cost of generation in that aspect of what we do? Okay, the analysts can go to your data and then say, okay, well, this up can be done, so we'll be fine. Instead of just letting them lose some data, then the, the analytics team and just still come back with misaligned uh, recommendations. At least in that, in that case, we have aligned recommendations which have a greater chance of being adopted. So, Robert, or the, Dr. Robert actually feels like actually his 30 years account for something. Okay, he's not being treated as a, this old dinosaur anymore, like this old grandpa who's spending all his money on booze and younger girls or whatever. Yeah. So, at least he feels like he can still have some decisional power. And he gets full credit for giving that steer because just because team she has not done knowledge yet, or very little bit. So at least who gets the credit for giving the steer? Well, Robert and his old colleagues, old, well, sort of experienced, you should say. So Jess, call me Jess. And now we can focus, our team can focus on business questions. And they spend less time monitoring now because the organization realizes is actually get far more credit, uh, far more uh, value, I should say, for actually having aligned uh, recommendations and just something that's really like the lowest of the low in terms of that organization, which is reporting and monitoring. And then Jessica's team can take credit for how experienced they are with analyzing the data, the methodologies they're using, and we feel a lot more pride in the work they do. And Jessica's team will be able to retain people a lot better than if they spend just time doing monitoring and reporting. So here we have a better deal. Okay, so all the analytics team is done already. Um, and cherry picking is just what I call being data justified as opposed to be data driven. And I shall read sites. Okay, yeah, we have to respect the decades of experience for people that the organization can bring. And actually, it's tremendous. Uh, uh, knowledge that we can benefit from when we join the team and when we don't recognize that, that's what I call uh, conservatorship, yes. So basically you just let those experienced people actually have a say in decisions as opposed to treating them as dinosaurs actually that just too old and they become senile and they don't know how to use that experience anymore and you see stuff. And the ultimate goal is to be a uh, data informed organization, which is a better balance between data-driven and data justified. So the, the middle road is what I call the form. And as I was saying earlier, nobody should be able to claim credit for being data-driven or how they try to do so. It's a collective credit that's been split like a front statue as well. The My Way song, more people can claim credit at different levels, so that's on. And the same should be applied to analytics and how we try to become digital organization. So only collectively we can make that claim. And that's me. Okay. I've got a bit more time for questions, perhaps, so or before we even kick out? No? <laughs> Oh yeah, session, so we can stay here until midnight, right? Huh? Before we the car study to pumpkins or no? <laughs> Yeah. Do you think that's something that a method uh, a way thinking that should be applicable to organization or to 
forcing cases organizations where it would be harder to have this kind of uh, depends. I guess all organizations, maybe that might work, but the organizations, maybe you don't have all the people so much in the organization with 30 years experience, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's just go with, maybe go with one stakeholder and then, okay, maybe the oldest one, the organization, and go back. I respect your experience, but I want to benefit from your experience. Um, let's work together in a way that benefits both of us. I don't want my team to spend their time doing monitoring and reporting all the time. We can bring more value. And ultimately, that will bring a better deal for both sides. And then, when other stakeholders see that success with that first relationship, then maybe other stakeholders will be very encouraged to do the same. Because we'll see that, that one stakeholder has a lot of success in ethics and they're feeling very well rewarded by the C-suite, and others are going to start feeling generous, right? And then more stakeholders are going to like, okay, um, I, uh, I'd like to take a page of your book to take that discussion. Uh, I want you to do the same thing as Robert. Okay, I want you to work with you, Jessica, the same way as you work with Robert. Can we work that way? Absolutely. And then eventually, that, that other way of thinking uh, just propagates the organization. Hopefully. That's, that's a nice scenario. I'm sure that uh, the organizations would be a lot harder. Yes, well, there are different types of And there are different characters to deal with. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Thank you.